Hello, everyone. Welcome back for another week of Tea With. Uh, we have someone very special and near and dear to our hearts tonight, Chuck Abasi, who is an actor, dancer, singer, director, writer, and educator, and fantastic board member of Thumbprint Studios. <laughs> Chuck is, serves as the co-director of Taya Creative. He is also a managing member with the Private Theater, an actor with the People's Theater Project, Movement Project Director at the Stella Adler Studios of Acting, Adjunct Professor of Musical Theater at Drew University, and Choreographer for Star Theater at the Director's Company. So he is doing a lot, y'all doing a lot. In conjunction with his artistic work, Obasi is a social justice advocate and has taught workshops on several social themes, as well as using art for social justice for colleges, high schools, and professional organizations. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from SUNY, oh gosh, I'm gonna really, Gen Genesea? Gen oh, I should have asked how to pronounce this, my dyslexic brain. <laughs> <laughs> like does not know how to pronounce basically anything. So I apologize to all of you out there. Uh, and was the recipient of the 2019 Zelda Fitchlander Award, a full scholarship to study with the Michael Chekhov Association. As a performer, he works on both stage and screen, a New York native raised in the Bronx. Obasi currently resides in Manhattan with his family. So tonight, Chuck is going to be talking about the invisible caste system and its effect on theater. So let us welcome Chuck. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for being here. And I apologize for butchering your bio. No, well, uh, a funny a funny thing about that is, uh, so SUNY Geneseo, and um, when, I, when I first got there, I, I used to pronounce it Geneseo, and, um, and I kind of pronounced it Geneseo my entire time there. And to this day, I decided to just pronounce it Geneseo, uh, but it's really Geneseo. Geneseo. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not alone. <laughs> Thank you for that yeah, generosity. No. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your journey. Like what brought you to where you're at today? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, 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 musical theater, actually. Uh, um, was my entry point to the performing arts, which which I started doing in, in high school. Um, my my science teacher got me uh, to audition for Guys and Dolls when I was a freshman, um, and and um, you know I was really uh, scared about doing it, but but when I did it, I just didn't want to do anything else. And so um, <laughs> at the time, I swore I was going to be this big musical theater person. And that was it, the be all end all. But, but I know it, it actually turned into other stuff. I mean, I, I did study uh, musical theater and dance as a double minor uh, in college to go with communications. But then uh, once I got into the professional world, I, I did, uh, I kind of like went towards straight theater and also towards writing and, and, uh, and, and, and choreography. And so, it was it was just going wherever the wind took me at that point, um, which really led me to a lot of uh, unique experiences, uh, uh, meeting a, a lot of uh, unique people, and um, and so I, I just feel like anything that I get introduced to, if I fall in love with it, I, I grasp onto it and, and I don't let it go, and uh, and so you know now I do like a ton of different things. <laughs> So in terms of falling in love and grasping on, uh, what is your current like love affair or obsession? Um, <laughs> um, uh, my, <laughs> it's funny, uh, what, so when I think my current obsession, my mind just went like in like every which direction, like even outside of career. Um, uh, career wise, um, I have, really sunken into writing lately um 
and I and I think I, I think that's because of the pandemic, really. Uh, I lost all of my performing work once um, places started getting locked down, and you know a lot of you know even directing work I lost because you know there was just no more performing. Uh, but what continued was writing projects um, and teaching online, and so those two things continued, and that has been. Uh, outside of outside of homeschooling my kids who are learning remotely um, as far as work I'm just teaching and writing and so I, I think writing is an obsession by default because that's like one of the only things available but it is something uh, that I deeply love because you know it, it gives me a, a way of really getting thoughts out of my head and telling stories that I want to see and perhaps I haven't quite seen um yet so so it works out <laughs> <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so your book recommendation for all of our thumbprint community members out there uh is cast the origin of our discontents uh which talks about how our country has an invisible caste system based on skin color so how does that manifest in our artistic community uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, first of all, that's, I really recommend that book, which was recommended to me from a colleague of mine at the private theater. Um, and so like at the private theater, we've kind of created this like book club. We were like, we read a book like every month and that's, that's uh, a member recommends and, and somebody recommended it to me. And, you know, I, I was kind of like drawn in after the first page and, um, you know, I've never really looked at our country as a caste system. Um, but to be able to look at it from that different perspective um, and also how it relates to racism, um, it, it's kind of created a shift in how I, how I look at you know, this, this country, uh, how it operates. And as far as how it, how it manifests in the, in the world of art, I think I would put it like um, like this. So another book that I recently read um, is is uh, How to Be an Anti Racist, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a chapter in that book that talks about spaces, um, you know, like a, a white space or a black space or a fill in the blank space. And you know, the uh, Ibram Kendi kind of describes a space being prescribed to a certain race based on who in that space has the most power or, and, or who like takes up the majority of the space, you know? Um, and so um, that was kind of applied to, you know, the concept of integrated school, right? So like if, if you integrate a school with, with, with people of different backgrounds, you might think that's, that the work is done and that it's integrated. Yet, if, if the education is still being told through a particular lens, then it still prescribes to that, that power or whatever that is, right? And so mm -hmm. um, that kind of framed for me what, what uh, defines a space. So how does that connect to what, what I'm getting to? Um, everything we do as artists here is done through the lens of whiteness um, from education, you know, and how we learn about history to what um, we're, who we're taught to aspire to, you know, um, and not, not to take away from the people that we're taught to aspire to but if you ever look into it, most of them are white. As a matter of fact, um, bef before tonight, just for fun, I just Googled, you know, just for the hell of it, I said, you know, greatest playwrights of all time. I just typed that in and to see what came up. <laughs> and, and, and guess what came up? You know, I, a lot of white men. Oh, yeah. A lot of white men, right. Yeah. White men. And and so I think out of, out of the first 100 playwrights. I think August Wilson was number 19. Mm -hmm. 
and Federico Lorca was like somewhere in the 20s. And then I think they threw Lin Manuel Miranda in there. And then that was it. Right? Um, wow. And then maybe two women, maybe two women, right? Two white women, right? And, and so what that says is the popular voices, you know, that influence us and educate us, they tell us that this is the ideal to work towards, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so us as artists who are learning our craft, who are learning the history, who are learning different canons, you know, that's the lens that we're all looking through. So you could say that the United States is a white space. And that's not to take away from anyone who is not white. There are people who are not white, who are amazing and fabulous and, and have power and have voices. But this overarching lens is a white lens. Um, and, and if you think of it that way, then this caste system kind of manifests in every fiber of our being as artists when we don't even realize it. Um, you know, and, and that, that's not something I, I kind of considered my entire life. It's, it's something that started to make more sense to me at the older I've been getting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, that's kind that's of what it feels like. Mm hmm so. Yeah. And so what effects does it have then on how we make theater? I think the effect that it has is that we, we subconsciously, um, we subconsciously rank uh, what the ideals are. Um, and to this day, white will still be the default. Um, to this day, I look at casting notices. I don't audition that often, um, <laughs> but I still have a backstage account that I just, you know, look at every often, every so often. And, and you're still going to see non-white roles listed as what that is, but the white characters are default as if everyone else is a novelty, right? And uh, yeah. mm -hmm. so that, that's one way that it shows up. Um, if, if you talk to someone who just got out of NYU or, uh, or Yale or any, any of these acting schools, you know, they're gonna, if, and then they're gonna tell you their learning experience. If it's someone who's an immigrant, or if someone who came speaking a different language or came with an accent, you know, there's a good chance that they had some story of being told their accent was, was a real taboo to have in this mm -hmm. industry in the United States. Um, and so, and there's, there's, there's a very good chance that, that they have experienced some deeply troubling, even microaggressions that may seem like nothing, but they carry with them. I've experienced that. You know, and so um, it, it, that kind of thing is hard to like uh, quantify how that shows up, but it shows up it sh and it doesn't, it doesn't just show up in our art. It just shows up in our lives, you know, and, um, it shows up in our anxiety and in our fear and even in our confidence. It's, it's, it's there because it's been uh, showing up to us in so many different ways our entire lives, you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if our art is a part of who we are or an expression of who we are, and this is so deeply ingrained, how could it not show up in our art? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. So if that's the case, in light of our current national movement towards racial justice and equity, uh, what can we do in the theater world to continue this conversation? Um, commit to a conversation for one, which, mm -hmm. which is a scary thing to do. And, um, you know, one thing I see a lot now is, is a lot of institutions trying to figure out what to do, you know, um, how to start to have a conversation. Um, you know, a lot of institutions put out statements um, in, in support of this current movement, which I appreciated, you know, some people saw it as hypocritical and, and you know, some people saw it as fake, but 
or performative, but um, but I think it's it is people with good intentions trying to figure it out, you know, what to do. And so I think, you know, having that journey and stumbling through that journey is a wonderful thing. And, you know, criticism is going to come with it. Optics are going to come with it. Um, and you're going to hear it and that might hurt you, but that's, that's part of the journey. You know, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable, but just, I would say, you know, we got to keep going uh, and we got to figure it out. You know, in some cases, people got to figure it out, figure it out on their own. And in, in some cases, we get to figure things out together. But, um, but I think the big picture, and this is scary, but I, I think we kind of have to overhaul the way we look at things. Um, and, and in my mind, it starts in school, in, in what we learn, you know, what we're told. Yes. You know, yes. If, 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 if school is to be seen as day one, and from day one, we're learning about an ideal to prescribe towards, which is through a European lens, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're starting from Athens, and then we're going through these different eras, like medieval and so on and so forth, to, to today, and, and, you know, and we start from Greece because the term theater is like derived from a Greek word, you know, but that's like, that's assuming that before like 500 BC, everybody was like, so what you want to do tonight? You know, like as if theater wasn't a thing, you know, maybe it <laughs> yeah. had a different name or maybe it showed up differently, but we just don't even consider the fact that there's a world outside of Europe when it comes to history. Um, and when it comes to any kind of history. And so uh. when, when Asian, when African history in theater becomes part of this core curriculum and not just like an elective mm -hmm. in the way we learn, then we're going in the right direction. And that feels scary to some people. That, that might even feel unjust to some people, which crazy enough, but it does. But that's what I think. Yeah, I think we need to even take it a step further and, and examine uh, the structure of education and how that is viewed through a white lens and how that is in, in a lot of cases very limiting to, to many people and try to break that down and, and rework and come up with some new structures and formalities, you know, to, to help support different perspectives, different learners, people from different backgrounds and embrace more of the history of of our world of all organic beings yeah yeah you know that's funny I, it reminds me of like my experience as a teaching artist and um you know just learning about reading people and reading people's body language and, and their facial expressions um and even education on how to read that was through this white lens because yeah. you know people were trained to like look at a face and say this person looks nervous this person looks worried this person looks anxious um you know but we come we we come to learn that in different cultures something that looks anxious to a white person may look excited to someone from another race let's say let's let's you know let, let, let's use this construct right mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. so if that's already the case then we're already starting to read people wrong um Right. And, and yep. uh, you know, and you spoke to learning styles and and it's true. We have different learning styles. You know, some some people like to listen to people talk and some people are more like kinesthetic, aesthetic um, learners. Um, but we we just prescribe to like what we've done and it, it's uncomfortable and even scary yeah. to imagine different ways of doing things. Totally. But anything worth doing is usually pretty scary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. or, I, or at least I try to tell myself anytime I'm really scared to do something, it probably means I should do it. Yeah. So, so Chuck, you're, you're homeschooling your kids. Is there, is there any tips that you have for parents are, out there that are, are looking to help break down these different structures and to provide a different lens for their kids, especially right now when a lot of parents are stepping in as teacher? Um, well, I'll say this. 
one one thing I've I've really uh, I've, I've appreciated two things from uh, these current circumstances with with uh, my my kids schooling. One is that I'm spending so much more time with them, and and, um, and I spent a lot of time with them before the pandemic hit. But but this is like this is so substantial. This is so unique, and um, you know, just seeing how how they learn and and just being just physically present has been huge. And then two, um, you know, while, you know, some of the learning is on Zoom and then they get homework from the teachers and then I, I help to see that through, I also get to supplement their learning. And um, it just really reinforces that it's, that education isn't just about what happens in the school, you know? Um, yeah. Me and my older son, Victor, we watched the debate last night and um because he really wanted to mm -hmm. and uh and he wanted to watch it because he wanted to know how politicians just dis have discourse and and um and that was such a teaching moment because i mean throughout the debate he would ask he would like turn to me and ask me a question and I'd be like, oh, hold on, hold on, i want to hear this you know and then he'd be like oh i'm not going to hang on and so he would watch and in the times he was laughing then uh, at the end of the debate, then he has like all these questions, and um, and we're talking about uh, like why is it why is it that it's okay for people to talk over each other, or 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 why or what makes one candidate better than the other, you know, or um, is it really true that um, one person is the, the least racist person that exists. Like, is that really true? And um, and so then we get to have these like conversations that are that derive from that initial conversation. Like what does racism mean? You know, and 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 the fact that that the way people define racism helps to inform whether or not they see themselves as racist. Um, you know, and and we and we have conversations about what it really means to be a leader and a, and a role model and why what we're seeing today is not what to um, aspire to, you know, what's not okay about uh, what we see. Uh, and he's like taking it all in and he's just following up with another question and then another question until he's like bored, but, but it's a while before he is bored. And that's like, that's a hell of an education that he got, you know? Yeah. Uh, hell of a class watching the debate and in that conversation after um and so just finding moments like that um has been something that i've i've um, i deeply appreciate and, and you know and i hope every parent gets those kinds of opportunities often with their kids that sounds can really i beautiful. just point out too how insightful some of those questions are for a nine-year-old also like just just wanted to point that out like as you were bringing them up as as um i was i was like really these are not things that i would have thought about as a nine-year-old um so <laughs> yeah, he's one of the most inquisitive people i know not kids but people <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'm, that sounds like it speaks to your parenting as well, that you've got such an inquisitive child. So to kind of switch gears a little bit, so you have studied uh, Michael Chekhov acting technique and, and we have um, as well. Uh, Michael Chekhov talks about theater of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you hope theater of the future looks like? Um. I hope the of the future is uh, one where the community is more spiritually connected. Um, what I what I love most about being a member of the Michael Chekhov Association is just the kinship I feel whenever I'm in the room with other people who are into this technique. And even on Zoom, I feel a spiritual connection when we are working together. Um, and these are people from all over the world, you know? And, you know, I, I, it just makes me think, like, how, how wonderful is that to, to meet someone 
perhaps for the first time as an artist and feel this kinship and creation and in using your imagination and in engaging your mind and your spirit and your body. Um, and if, if, if that kind of kinship can exist on a larger scale, on a global scale, you know, so, and I can speak to that in, in terms of anything, but we're talking art, we're talking theater. Um, that's, a, that's a feature that would make me so happy. Uh, and, and knowing that life imitates art, perhaps that would kind of like in, uh, affect, affect our communities in a way. Um, just appreciating that kinship. And, uh, when, you, when you truly love someone, then that's, that's really gonna change the way you have this course and, and it's gonna change. Um, you know, I'm such an idealist, I know, but, um, but it, it's true though. Um, and so in, in one way, that's kind of a feature I would hope for. And, and and let's let's mix that up with with an overhaul of of of, of how we place a lens on ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. You got yeah, me. I'm, yeah, you got I know me. you got me too. <laughs> I'm like I have nothing more to say at this point because that's. Yeah, I mean, my little idealist heart as being part of the. Uh, Michael Chekhov Association is like, wow, that would be amazing if that's if that's what theater of the future looked like. Mm. Um, so I'm with you. I'm with you there all the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and and I know that uh, challenging times do bring people together, uh, as like, yeah. the one, like the one that we're in now. Um, and and we are going to get through it. And then when we get through it. Um, you know, where, where are we going to go? And that's, so that's a question that's sitting in the back of my mind. And um, so it's, it's just my hope that um, to any degree that we're um, pushing to unite ourselves, uh, that, that we just keep that up, you know, even when things um, return to some sense of what we once called normalcy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. That is an excellent way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you are actually going to be teaching a class for us um, on Thursday, uh, this coming Thursday, October 29th, uh, yeah. 6.30 to 8.30 Central Time. Yeah. Yay! Yay! Uh, it's Movement for Actors. So could you tell us a little bit about your class? Yeah, let's go. Um, so, yeah, movement for actors. It, it's a it's a it's a workshop that I've done um, in different places, and it's essentially it's a way of exploring what it looks like to engage every element of who you are, and and I'm talking about the physical, but then also the spiritual and the mental and emotional. And how do we connect all of those aspects of our being as performers? Um, you know, I, I find that um, many artists that I work with may lead with one of those elements, you know, and, and, um, and it most commonly in my experience, people I work with are most uncomfortable in their bodies. Um, you know, and, and to use your body doesn't necessarily mean to dance, but it, but to use your body as a tool, um, as part of storytelling, um, as part of imagine the imagination. Uh, what what does that look like when we explore that confidently? And so, you know, simply put, it's it's really just about finding that confidence. And if you're already confident, then how do we have fun and experiment? Um, and hone that craft of, um, of that of interconnectedness of self, interconnectedness of aspects of your own being. And so, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's fun, we have fun, um, we talk, we don't talk, 
you know, we, we, we think, we try to not think um, if that's possible. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's essentially what it is. But um, I, I find that uh, it's, it's something that we can sink into even through a screen. And, um, you know, I, I have taught it on, on, on Zoom a few times, most recently uh, with, with the Labyrinth Theater here in New York as part of their summer intensive ensemble and um, participants had a great time. Um, and so I, I really hope to, to continue that journey um, here with Thumbprint. So, you know, if, if, if you hear this come through, um, you know, holla at us, I, I would love to see you. I'd love to work with you. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to form new relationships and, and reconnect on old ones. Let's, let's go. Excellent. Yes, please come. I'm very excited about it. Yes. Um, excited I'm, to have kinship and creation. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So to wrap this up, what would you like everyone to leave with today? Um, I would like everyone to to leave with to leave with the fact that uh, that connectivity is possible um, it's possible and it doesn't it doesn't feel possible right now um, in the general scope of things you know but but it is um, and I guess what I would what I would also like to leave people with is that while we're in a very challenging time right now, uh, it is a temporary challenge um, that we can and will overcome. And when we do, um, I, I truly hope that we're better artists for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been excited all week to have you here for tea. <laughs> so, um, oh, thank you, uh, <laughs> I really appreciate being in, invited to have this conversation. Um, you know, I, I appreciate being in, invited to uh, teach that this workshop that we're going to have next Thursday. And, um, and I'm really excited to see, you know, what's in store for, for thumbprint, uh, in the, in the near and distant future. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, um, so this week we have Czech's workshop on Thursday, the 29th. Uh, we also have coming up, um, our Thumbprint Reads and Listens is on November 2nd uh, from... Is it at 6.30 as well? 6.30? Yeah. <laughs> central time. <laughs> 6.30 central time. Uh, we will be discussing Zomo the Rabbit by uh, Salmene24. It is a uh, hip hop youth uh, play. Uh, it's gonna be very cool. Uh, we are super excited about this one. Um, it is limited registration, however, because it is an unpublished play. So we had to go through the um, the artist agent, and so they only gave us access to a certain number of copies. So please, please, please get registered as soon as possible so that you can come uh, discuss this with us. It's gonna be really awesome. We're very excited about it. Uh, please uh, check us out at www.thumbprintstudios.org. You can find the links to sign up for both of those things on our website. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Chuck, for this fabulous tea with tonight, and we will see you all next week. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>